last Sunday, I got the news actually as I was in an airport. Here I am sitting, it was in Louisville, Kentucky. CNN, my Twitter feed exploding. And I wrote this that afternoon. I had to work to take it in. My natural reaction was to keep the horror of this event at a distance, keeping my heart safe from grief and outrage. But slowly and as an answer to prayer, the sadness, the weariness, the empty silence of mourning poured in. Someone said, the deeper the grief, the fewer the words. That's how I feel. Words of condolences have little value in the face of this carnage. For right now, all we can do is grieve, pray, and support the family and friends of those who have died as best we can. I will leave it to others to look for someone to blame. Instead, right now, all I want to do is stand beside, pray, and love as best I can. There will be time later to raise questions about security, gun violence, and homophobic rage. There is no justification for this atrocity. I categorically condemn what has happened. Better solutions must be found. What I do believe is that love is stronger than death. The promise of resurrection brings courage. And the promise of a new heaven and a new earth should fuel all of God's people to help build a better world. After all, what Christians pray is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Since then, words of prayer and encouragement have come from all over the world. Just in my office alone, I've received words from Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury in London, England, who took the time to write a handwritten note and then send it as a PDF email. From friends in Egypt, the Congo, Korea, Canada, Pakistan, Honduras, Nigeria, Paris, France. People are holding us up in great love and in prayer. Besides, in countless vigils all across the planet. I compare two different stories, both of which are from local Orlando people. One is from an editor of a newspaper now in Macon, Georgia, by the name of John Galuli. John Galuli's grandfather, both sides, one was the head of McCoy Airfield, and the other was the president of Sun Bank. Grew up here, a child of Orlando. He, said, he wrote this in his column. He said, Orlando, as my grandparents pronounced it, is a magical place for a child, not just because it's home to the happiest place on earth, Disney, but because it's a city of lakes and orange trees and families who believe in their community. He said, consequently, the feelings that accompany your hometown being attacked by a terrorist is altogether different from when a terrorist attacks elsewhere. The assault on my memories and love for my city and its people deflate me like a flat tire. And yet I hear extraordinary reports of kindness and heroism. Consider the many residents who lined up to donate much needed blood or the Marine who worked at a bouncer at the Pulse Club, recognizing the sound of gunfire, he found a way to help 60 to 70 people escape. Or the mother who literally got on top of her son, she dying, he alive at that club. Or the emergency room doctors, and no one can forget the story of Dr. Joshua Corsa, whose blood-soaked tennis shoes became an icon of the suffering that has happened within this city. His heroism, as well as those of first responders and all of the people who served at Orlando Regional Medical Center, will 
hopefully never be forgotten. So he says, in spite of this horror, the magic is not gone from my city. The, that magic is alive and well, not in the form of a fantasy theme park, but because people came together during a terrorist attack to help their brothers and sisters. He said, this gives me such pride in my hometown, a city that has been terribly assaulted, but will never be defeated. And then another story of something of contrast. This was sent to me in a private email from someone who loves and cares for the Episcopal Church. He told a different story. He told a story of growing up and being forced to come out of the closet as a gay young man in high school because after confiding in a friend, that friend began to spread the story. He said, it didn't go well. I was physically assaulted throughout my sophomore year of high school. This is someone who is now a college student, so it wasn't all that long ago. He said, I didn't want to talk about it. In fact, what I wound up doing was joining the football team just to cover my injuries as sports-related accidents. I did not want to tell my parents how it happened because I knew I would only sadden them and cause them to walk in the fear that I already knew. The story, sadly, even in our community, is that while the Pulse attack was horrific, out of the ordinary, there is something that happens when you're gay that you almost fear when the shoe will drop and you will be rejected next. We have a long way to go before thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we gather here, as Dean Kidd rightly said, we gather under the extended hands of Jesus, who says with tremendous passion and timeless relevance, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Here you see is the great reveler, leveler. No matter who you are, no matter how many times you want to point the finger at a them rather than a you, we come here and we find all kinds of people gathered here. Friends, neighbors, enemies. People with whom we are theologically in disagreement. People who would oppose some of the things that we say and believe. And yet it is here we gather because it is here that in the presence of the God who made the whole earth that all of our own stories, experiences are brought into alignment. And that is only something that God himself can do. Without that kind of both community as well as the presence of God, all you have left is yourself. Why walk in such aloneness? I can take solace from others who will certainly stand with me, but no human presence answers the void inside, not entirely because they are temporal, just like I am. They are broken, just like I am. They have their faults and their gifts and their graces, just like I do. And while it is always a miracle when two broken people can finally find a way to align together into that relationship that bonds us together, the fact of the matter is, is that outside of this great presence called God, who fills us and shows us love, which is what we see in the face of Jesus, even the best of our relationships never entirely take care of the hunger that will not let us go. Because it is that hunger that God put in our hearts for eternity, for something larger than we are. There is a hunger inside of all of us to know something more than we presently know. And it is that curiosity, often playful, sometimes demanding, that is inviting us into a presence bigger than us. And that's part of why we're here. To hope beyond hope, 
that what was read to us tonight from Revelation, a place where there is no pain or grief, a place where God wipes away every tear from every eye, can in fact be true, and that I, by the mercy of God, not because I deserve it, can in fact know a foretaste of that kind of love now because that's what we see in the face of Jesus Christ. So we gather here to commend to God those whom we love, to offer to God all that is in our hearts, because His love is stronger than anything that we would bring into His presence, regardless how beautiful or regardless of how vile and ugly all of humanity, all of us, all those who have died, including the shooter, can gather underneath the cross of Jesus Christ and know His forgiveness and His mercy and His great, great love. So I would ask you, open your heart to Him, to that God, that as we go forth from these days, we will have what it takes to build this better world because that love is stronger than death and that love will give us the fuel that we need to both know mercy in here and extend mercy out here too because that's what is given to us. Nothing more, but certainly nothing less because that's what love does. It extends and gives mercy. Amen.